whole body hyperthermia is a new term for a lot of people. And um, it's a really important one because there, there is a, um, that is what, you know, clinically was used or is used to, um, to treat, or shown to help treat uh, depression. And um, it's, a, it's a, can you explain the, the, the nuance there with uh, whole body hyperthermia and how that's different from just going in the sauna? Sure, um, sure. So it's, it's an emerging field. And like you said, a lot of people are familiar with sauna. It's at their gym. It's maybe even in their house. It's when they go on vacation. And going in the sauna and sweating and then leaving it is very pleasurable. It is often relaxing, calming. People enjoy doing it. They often report that they feel better afterward. Whole body hyperthermia protocols are a little bit more intense. <laughs> so if you ask someone who went into one of the saunas and one of the studies that I'm sure we're going to talk about today, they might just not tell you it was a spa-like experience. It's very intense. There's a lot of sweating and you get very, very hot. And whereas with sauna, you might go in it for 15, 20 minutes, go out of the sauna to cool down for a bit, go back in. With whole body hyperthermia protocols, you're getting heated pretty consistently for quite a while until you're on the other side and you're going to be done. It's not so much a going in and going out and going in um, process. And with whole body hyperthermia protocols, especially in studies, there have been a lot more steps to control the experience than, say, going to a, a sauna at your gym. And we can get into what some of those are if we want to talk about the specific studies. But um, they're pretty different experiences, although they both involve heat. And it, maybe like um, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the preliminary findings that got you <clears throat> interested in this research mm -hmm. in, the, mm -hmm. in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. So in 2016, this paper came out by Jansen and a bunch of other co-authors, where they reported on a whole body hyperthermia protocol that they had used to test as a treatment for clinical depression. And this study was impressive for a number of reasons. They recruited 30 some odd participants who had pretty significant depression. And they randomized half of them to get a whole body hyperthermia treatment or half of them to get a sham whole body hyperthermia treatment. And I'm going to talk about what the differences are there in a second. But it was a very good idea for a placebo um, condition for this study. So the whole body hyperthermia condition, the folks randomized to receive this were put into a kind of whole body hyperthermia machine that involved infrared heating lamps. And this is a pretty fancy machine they run about $50,000. You only find them in hospitals. They're made in Germany. Um, it's called a Heckel, and it's a pretty involved experience. So these people who were randomized to receive whole body hyperthermia went into this sauna tent, if you will, the Heckel machine, and they were heated until they reached a core body temperature of 38.5 degrees Celsius. After that time, the sauna was turned off and they stayed in there anyway for another hour just lying there. And during that time, their temperature actually continued to rise all the way up to about 38.85 or so degrees Celsius. And all during that time, they are sweating, sweating, sweating. They are hot. And what's really important to know about this sauna tent is that their head is outside of the sauna. So you asked about one of the differences between regular sauna and whole body hyperthermia. This is a major one. When you go into a sauna, your whole body is going into the sauna, including your head. <laughs> With these whole body hyperthermia protocols, in many cases, your head is not in the heating element. It's outside of it. So you can be drinking. Um, a person can be attending to your head, putting cool cloths on it, and so on, like they did in that Janssen study. Now, the other half of the people who didn't get the whole body hyperthermia, they were actually put in that same machine, but it wasn't turned on to be very hot. And they, the lamps turn on. And they got a little bit warm, but they didn't get anywhere near as warm. I think it was like 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit that, they, that the control condition got into. And what's more is that the authors of the study actually asked all of the participants, so what do you think you got? Do you think you got the real deal, the whole body hyperthermia, or do you think you got the, the control condition? Some 71% of people in that control condition thought they got the actual sauna treatment. So why is that exciting? Because when you actually look at the change in the depression scores for these people, it was pretty remarkable. The drops in depression within a week were pretty impressive. And what's more, those drops were maintained six weeks later. And this was one whole body hyperthermia session. And so the difference between the groups was pretty notable um, six weeks out and especially one week out. And this study caught my eye 
for a few reasons. One is that as a whole, in this country, many other countries, we're not just great at treating depression. It's a big problem. Antidepressants work for many people, therapy works for many people, but we still have a long way to go in developing treatments for depression. And when you see a treatment like that, with that strong of a control condition, and those effect sizes and those reductions in depression, it catches your eye. So I got really excited about that, started looking more into, well, what else has been done with this? And it turned out there was one other study in 2013, the Hanush paper, um, where they just recruited depressed participants, they gave them the sauna session, and then they looked at them afterward. And there's some really neat, striking findings about that study as well. But it was, it was a single arm study, so there was no control condition. But those two studies got me really excited and started me down this path, um, in particular with looking at temperature. You said for the, um, there was a couple of things you said um, with, with, you know, Dr. Charles Rezan's study, 2006 study, mm -hmm. um, with this heckle machine, this whole mm -hmm. body hyperthermia, where, that are really um, important. And, and those are that one, you said that there was an effect within just a week of treatment, which is quite quickly. It's yeah. soon. I mean, like, if you think about classical, like, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are SSRIs, which are used very, you know, widely for, mm -hmm. you know, depression treatment, mm -hmm. they don't work that quick. They don't right. work immediately like that. So right. that was one thing, and to get your thoughts. And two, the, the fact that they did one session and it lasted six weeks. Mm -hmm. Like, they didn't have to keep going every day or even every week. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just did it once. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was a six-week, like there was an, a, a lasting effect. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on... Oh, it, on it, was, it was pretty... It was a big moment for me. And what I realized when I was thinking about that very SSRI thing was that, well, wait a minute, what do SSRIs have in common with all of this? And I went back and I looked at some of the SSRI literature, and it turns out that one of the most common side effects of SSRIs is hyperhidrosis. It's sweating. So then I thought, huh, sweating, the, one of the most common side effects of SSRIs. And yet, with whole body hyperthermia, what are we actually doing? We should probably actually go back into, into why this, some of the mechanisms a little bit here with this. But that really made me think, OK, wait a minute. Do we have actual data now? Has anybody published on whether sweating in response to SSRIs is associated with if they are effective or not? I'm actually not aware of a paper that has done that. It'd be a great paper and a great analysis to do. Um, I hope someone's working on it. I'd love to work on it. There's a lot of data that um, we could use to test that. But getting back to um, your question about, wow, this works really fast. Yeah, SSRIs take weeks, can take months before they start to work, whereas Dr. Raison noticed these effects in just a week mm -hmm. in his study design. And yes, they did last out to six weeks. Now, they didn't measure beyond six weeks. So we don't know what happened, mm -hmm. and that's a key area of future research. But um, maybe we should talk a little bit about the hypothesis underlying why this might be working. And that's where my mind went after I saw that 2016 paper. I thought, my goodness, what's going on here? Well, it turns out there is literature showing temperature dysregulation in people with depression back early 1980, 82, and then 97, um, a researcher, Dr. Avery, published some work showing that people with depression often have higher nighttime body temperatures, and they're not as good at thermoregulatory cooling. They don't sweat as much to cool themselves down. And what's also been interesting is that there's other work that shows that when people with depression get better, when their depression symptoms lessen, their core body temperature also can decrease. And that's in the context of other treatments that aren't related to sauna treatment. For example, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT. Um, there was a paper that showed that with successful ECT treatment, the patient's temperatures dropped alongside their depression. And from that Hanush paper, that single arm sauna trial, what they found was that the decrease in body temperature was correlated with the decrease in depression. And they measured that decrease in body temperature pretty carefully. They were using an indwelling rectal probe. Yeah. So they were really measuring it those five days afterward. Um, and that says something about the mechanism here with body temperature. So yes. talk, let's talk about that study, which hopefully will start 
Yes. Very soon. So we're really looking forward to this study. Um, it's going to be a three-year project to do th this pair of two studies. The first study will be 16 people, and everybody's going to get the same thing, and I'll talk about what that is in a second. And the second study is going to be 30 people. And half of those people get one thing, and half of those people get another thing. So let's talk about what everybody's getting in the first study. So first of all, in both these studies, we're going to measure all of those biomarkers. It's going to be pretty exciting. You've mentioned a number of them so far. BDNF, heat shock proteins, inflam inflammatory cytokines, um, gosh, CRP. There's a, a, a little bit of a laundry list we've got going. So people that don't know what BDNF is... Brain-derived neurotrophic, neurotrophic factor. factor. And what role does that play in depression, just like generally speaking? Uh, my it, goodness. So I'm not up to snuff, I would say, on all of the biological underpinnings with these molecules with depression. It's one of the but things that exercise has been yeah, shown to increase, and it's but, thought that may help with neuroplasticity. Right, and, but there's been a whole bunch dating back to <clears throat> Dar Dr. Charles Rizan's paper in 2007 called Cytokine Sing the Blues, looking at how depression may be in, quite inflammatory right. for some people yeah. who have it. And so we know that exercise is temporarily inflammatory when you do it, but it's actually in a good way because of the adaptive changes that follow from that. The so, anti-inflammatory changes. Yes, yeah. right. Um, so the thought is, well, sauna is hopefully quite similar, and we have a bunch of data that suggests that it is looking in that direction. We still need to do the research though. So in this first study, we will have 16 people with major depressive disorder. We will recruit them, they will all be adults. And in addition to getting a whole body hyperthermia treatment, they're also going to get something called cognitive behavioral therapy for depression. So what is that? Cognitive behavioral therapy is a psychotherapy used for depression. It's considered gold standard. It's a first line treatment for depression. It doesn't involve medications. It's just a therapist who provides this treatment. It's pretty structured. It's pretty standardized. There are very specific tools that are often used across all of the different ways of administering this treatment. But the idea is that thoughts impact our feelings and how we feel impacts our behavior. So for example, if you have someone who has, let's say, type 2 diabetes, and they come in and they say, I'm never going to be able to get my blood sugar under control, never going to be able to do it. I just can't seem to stick to this diet. I'm always going to fail. I'm never going to be able to do this. When someone has those series of thoughts, how do you think they feel? Not so great. They don't feel so great. And when you don't feel so great, what do you do? Well, the chocolate cake sounds pretty good. Maybe I'll eat some chocolate cake to feel better. But then you eat the chocolate cake, which reinforces the thought, I can't do this. I'm never going to be able to stick to this diet, and so on and so forth. So thoughts, feelings, behavior, thoughts, feelings, behavior. And so interrupting that loop is a major part of cognitive behavioral therapy for depression, and there's a bunch of different ways that that's done. Anyway, this treatment is known to work. However, it doesn't work if people won't do it. And what is one of the major reasons why people with depression can't really get some benefits out of psychotherapy? They can't really engage because they're super depressed. Notwithstanding, of course, there are huge problems with our medical healthcare system in terms of being able to get therapy. That's a whole nother can of worms that we don't need to go into. But the point that I'm making is just that if patients can't really engage in therapy, they can't really get the benefits out of therapy. So in this treatment, everybody's going to get whole body hyperthermia as well as cognitive behavioral therapy sessions not at the same time, they might be on separate days, and, or they might be on the same day but one after the other. And you might be wondering, well, where did this idea come from? <laughs> like, why give cognitive behavioral therapy with whole body hyperthermia? And that dates back to a few different things. And I think, this, I think you and Dr. Charles Rizan talked about this during your discussion about some of the traditional origins of sauna. It's often been a communal process. Native American sweat lodges, people don't go in those by themselves, right? There's, it's, it's a group, or in the Korean kilns, or in the Russian banyas, right? It's been a social experience. And one thing that uh, Chuck told me about the 2016 paper and about that study was that during the study, the patients who were getting the whole body hyperthermia often started chatting. I don't remember if you guys talked about this part or not, but 
I just from personal experience. It's yeah. absolutely true. I mean, you become chatty when you're in the sauna and like yep. you talk to people and like, yeah. Yeah. Started wanting to connect, started mm -hmm. wanting to. And so the research assistants went back to the investigators and said, the patients are talking. What should we be saying to them? What should we be doing? And I remember when, when Chuck told me this story and just thinking, huh, well, if whole body hyperthermia is making people want to talk more, and one of the major reasons why people don't do well in therapy is that they don't want to talk and they don't want to engage, should we be pairing these things? Could using heat then cause people to be able to be more engaged in therapy? And so this is the ultimate mind-body type intervention, right? There's no drugs here. And if we can develop something like this that gets around prescribing people medications, maybe this is a good way to go. So propose this dual intervention with a mind and a body component and that's what we're moving forward with. So we're developing that combined intervention. And then in the second study with the 30 people, we're randomizing half of people to just get the cognitive behavioral therapy, which we know works. It's in the literature. There's reviews, meta-analyses showing that cognitive behavioral therapy for depression works. Half people will get that. And then half will also get the whole body hyperthermia sessions. And we will see, does adding the whole body hyperthermia lead to larger depression decreases? And you might be wondering, well, why don't you do it differently? Why didn't you just do just the sauna versus like just CBT or something like this? Well, it's really tricky ethically to recruit patients with depression and then not provide them with a treatment that we know works and tell them, oh, and by the way, don't do anything else while you're doing this thing. That's a very, very tricky thing to do. The better thing to do is to say, okay, here's what we know we have already. Can we do better than that? So one of the key gaps that we're addressing is we're going to be giving people eight weekly whole body hyperthermia sessions. Right. So that's a lot. We're going to see, are people willing to do this? Do they get more benefit this way? Because all of the, those other two studies that I mentioned, they only gave one whole body hyperthermia session, and we saw that huge drop one week later. Right. What happens if we give a second session one week later? Are we going to see another huge drop? We don't know. Right. We need those data. So we're going to be doing multiple whole body hyperthermia sessions. We're also going to be measuring body temperature at night during their entire time that they're in treatment because they're going to use a wearable device to when do that. When they're sleeping. When they're yeah. sleeping instead of using, you know, an indwelling rectal probe. That's kind of a hard sell to get people to wear <laughs> that for like, I don't know, 10 weeks. I don't, think, I don't think they're going to go for it. We're going to measure depression symptoms daily using smartphones so that we can actually see when symptoms are changing. We're going to measure all of those biomarkers and we're going to have all these in relation to each other. And one of the things I really hope we discover too is how willing are people to do this kind of sauna treatment? And then you know, obviously seeing how long it lasts. We're going to measure outcomes further than one week and six weeks, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but what my hope is that is that we might be able to develop almost a booster method if, if in the future this seems like a, a good idea after this next study, and I, I really hope it does. But you see on the internet that you can buy all these sauna tents that you can use at home. You know, people with people, there's always oh, a picture. Oh, people have them, yeah. And they've got their, their hands out and they're reading their magazine and their heads out and it looks kind of funny. You could see them on all the different websites. Well, what 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 if we actually need to do, do a certain number of this intensity of whole body heating, like the kind that we're talking yeah. about here, but then at home it could be supplemented and it could be maintained or, or sustained in this way. And that's a great model moving forward. Would people rather, you know, take drugs that, maybe aren't working so well or maybe come with a certain number of side effects or say, oh, once a week I have to sit, sit in this thing for 45 minutes and read a magazine, right? Um, so if we can develop a longer-term model for maintaining wellness and maintaining reductions in depression symptoms, that would be a huge win.